three, two, one. Cool. Okay. Not that was bad. bullshit, by the way. <laughs> 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 Hey folks, it's Mark again, on my own, just doing a cash call. Uh, we live in really troubling times and it's quite difficult for some of us right now, so anything that you can do to give us some money to make this podcast self-sustaining would be hugely appreciated. We've also got some ideas to actually make this podcast better and to do various other types of content beyond just this show. So if you guys are feeling a bit generous, you can go over to our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash unsung pod. Check out some of our tiers and see what you can get for your hard earned cash. It starts from as little as $2, but if you were to start off at $5, we would give you a dedicated anthem, which we hope would play in any room that you ever walk into. Although we can't arrange for that to happen. So I'm going to shout out a couple of them just now and I hope that you guys think that they're appropriate for you. And when I say you, I mean the people in question. So Mr. Brian Gallagher, you didn't give us any hints as to what your favourite records were, so we decided that Kiss From A Rose by Seal would be your dedicated personal anthem. And it's a total banger, so if you don't like it, then I don't know what you say to you, mate, sorry. Um, Callum McCormick, good friend of mine. I already know his favourite album, so I just gave him a Menzinger song called After the Party. Which I hope he digs. And finally... I'm just randomly looking down my list here. Um, Mike Shields, you gave us $5 a month, or you are giving us $5 a month, rather, should I say. Um, you didn't give us any clues to your favourite records, so we decided to give you I Wanna Sex You Up by Colour Me Bad. That's bad. Two Ds. So, people, hope you like your anthems. Other people, go and check them out. See what you can get. Check out our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash on some pod. And enjoy the rest of the show. Hey folks, uh, welcome to an unsung special episode. We've managed to get a guest. Somehow we've wrangled a mysterious <laughs> American <laughs> to come on our show. <laughs> um, we're joined this week by uh, Steve Wontel, um, who is in the band Neurosis. He's done stuff with Tribes of Europe, Harvest Man, and obviously Man Unto Himself. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, Mark, you missed it, Culper Ring, but I wasn't going to pull you up on that. <laughs> uh, Steve, yeah, thanks for joining us, man. Um, I guess you were briefed on the format of this in advance, right? Yeah, yeah, and I checked it out. I had to make sure you guys were legit, so I, I went Yeah, uh, I, I dove into a couple of your... I actually was going to take notes and critique your critiques, but... Um, <laughs> Decided against I'm, it. I'm pretty used to that. Um, <laughs> what what episodes did you choose, man? Uh, Just I, I definitely did the Sonic Youth. All right. Uh, one and um, shit. I can't. I, then I did part of another one. 
was on a long drive down south. But uh, did you disagree about Sonic Youth? With with some folks, yeah, I can't place the voice with with the with the face yet, but, and I don't remember what my exact grievance was. But uh, I, I'm the one that's always right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rather ripped as my choice. I knew it was controversial, but. Um, yeah, so we're going to try and get some kind of flow to this. Uh, Steve, you've got a new album and uh, your first book, at least book of poetry coming out. So we'll kind of talk about that first and foremost. Then we want to do like a little uh, bit of a grilling on your back catalogue, some of your experiences, maybe ask you some questions that you don't often get asked. Uh, feel free to just pretend your signal's breaking up if you don't want to answer. <laughs> and uh, no problem. And then we'll finish uh, with uh, a selection that you've made of what you consider an unsung album. Um, a, re- a really fine selection I have to say as yeah. well one I really enjoyed so uh, yeah we'll get to that in due course but first and foremost as Mark said Steve you've been performing for many years under your, your own name uh, aside from your other projects and you have a new record called No Wilderness Deep Enough what is done Uh, what is it, early August it's due, man? Oh, yeah, August 7th, coming up. I've been, what's the word, swatting up on some of the details of this. I really like the uh, genesis of it um, at your wife's house, family's house in Germany, right? But maybe you can like fill us in on some of that because it was, it was pretty intriguing. Yeah, it, um, the, the entire process of, of making this record was unintentional and uh, very much part of an, an accidental pro- process, which... You know, over the years, I've learned that that's often where the best stuff comes anyway, but um, it was just a normal visit to see my in-laws. They live in northern Germany, uh, about 30 minutes outside of Bremen. Their family has lived on the exact same house site, the exact same farm, the exact same land for over 500 years. And even by old world standards, that's a long time for one family to be on the same exact spot. I mean, the same... Yeah, we're, we're pretty jaded, but that's still pretty good going yeah. by our standards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might have moved down the block. They didn't, you know? <laughs> uh, and so, I'm guessing it's a nice place then, yeah, man. It's a, it's a lovely part of the world, northern Germany. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, and uh, it's it's no secret that I'm obsessed with uh, megaliths and ancient cultures, and, and it's right in this part of Germany called the Strasse der Megalith Kultur, where it's the landscape is, is uh, littered with with megalithic sites, uh, including one that her grandfather would drive her to for little picnics on their bicycle, you know? So, uh, I'm always kind of in a heavy mindset when I'm there thinking about, um, as opposed to the, the connection I have to the wilderness here, which seems more wild and, uh, a little more untamed, that land has been cultivated as evidenced by the megaliths and and just the last 500 years of her family that land has been cultivated for so long there's there's nothing wild about it but it seems very steeped with these kind of familial ghosts or spirits and i'm not talking you know ghostbusters type ghosts i'm talking more (laughs) just the energy of the land itself um i think that that's a really interesting observation i think like a lot of the literature a lot of the even the horror movies that come from there tend to pick up on that i think it's no coincidence that things like the volkish movement in like the 20s and 30s that led to the nazi party really they relied on that kind of sense of hauntedness that the land has there there's been a lot of blood spilled in that land as well and there's just a kind of uh, spiritual weight to that part of europe i think that tends to sort of hang around you when you when you're there i find I, I agree, and, and I. So anyway, back to the how it gets to the record is um, I was suffering from a horrible case of of uh, jet lag, couldn't couldn't sleep at all, um, which I- isn't really unusual. But I think the kind of hallucinatory state I ended up in really kind of opened me up to the energy of the land. I wasn't looking to create anything, but I set up a very simple electronic setup in my wife's childhood bedroom there with just. Uh, a keyboard and a laptop and some headphones and so i finally decided I'm, i just i can't lay here and torture my mind anymore by wishing i was sleeping when i'm clearly not so you know in those magic hours between two and six or whatever i would uh just kind of putz around and, the, and i found i stumbled onto this piano sound which was very realistic and very responsive it was uh i don't really 
do many kind of like fake sample instruments, but it was very responsive and felt very much like it was moving air, like a true upright piano. And just these really simple chord progressions, and I'm not a piano player, so they, these were very basic chords, uh, just started flowing out. And uh, if I had been in my right mind, I probably would have dismissed it and moved on to something else. Um, but I was just happy to kind of sit there and trance out on these simple two and three chord progressions. And and over the over the following week, I started layering some mellow. T- I just kind of followed these simple chord progressions, which seemed to suggest some complex harmonics, even though they were simple chords. So the next night, I would maybe add some Mellotron string samples, and the the next night, I would add a French horn piece. And by the end of the week, I had this... I didn't know what it was. Still didn't think I was creating anything. I was just messing around because I couldn't sleep. So brought it home into, and, the, into this room here in my home studio, added synthesizers. Um, I kept revisiting it and tripping out on it. And by by that winter... I had basically made the album almost as you hear it without the real piano, the real French horn and a a real cello and without any voice. But basically the structure of it, I wondered what I had created. It was like some ambient record that with some nods to kind of some neoclassical minimalism. You hear a lot of what I've listened to my entire adult life, you know, some uh, little kind of Brian Eno, some trippy psychedelia and some uh, kind of haunting minimal classical music but again i'm not a composer so this all just kind of materialized very intuitively and i wasn't i wasn't planning on singing on it at all i didn't know what it was i thought well maybe is it my harvest man record but it it seemed like if i plugged in one of these guitars and a fuzz pedal and made noise on top of it that would have been uh, the wrong move and so I, i ran it by my friend randall dunn he's a great engineer producer did my last solo record Um, I said, you know, hey, can we book time? I want to replace this piano with a real piano and uh, get a cello player to bring life to some of the Mellotron 70s sounding strings and a real French horn. And by the way, I have no idea what this is, but I want to I want to finish it. And he said, well, yeah, we we should definitely replace those things in the studio. I think that would sound great. And in kind of his own way, because he's a lot nicer than I am. He uh, basically said, don't be a wimp, sing on it and make it your next solo record. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I totally disagreed. Thought that was the wrong way to go. I didn't need my harsh croak on top of this pretty music. Before it's time to fade. But I took it as a challenge, and it was by this time it was winter break from school. My wife was back in Germany visiting her folks, and so it was just me and the dogs here alone in the house, buried in snow, and uh, every morning I woke up with my coffee and one microphone in our living room and just improvised vocals, and by the end of that week I had all the words, all the vocal melodies and harmonies, it pulled something really different out of me, vocally, more expressive, more out there on a limb, and uh, I called Randall and told him he was absolutely right, and that uh, let's book time. A couple of things kind of occur to me there, man. Um, it sounds like, as you say, it was really unplanned, kind of quite a sort of an evolving project. Do you, uh, do you find it's a bit, it's still got a lot more um, enjoyment for you as a listener? You know, because you've not sat and played and gigged these songs and workshopped them and all that kind of thing. Great like, question. How do you feel about yeah. it? Yeah, no, that, that, it's funny because... Songs that I've worked on a lot, like previous solo records or Neurosis records, for example, once those are done, I never want to, I never want to listen to them again. One, because it's weird to listen to yourself. <laughs> and two, because you hear the labor. Um, and um, this one is like Harvest Man stuff I can listen to because I didn't write it. just turned on all these electronics and weird shit happened and i recorded it and uh you know i I work on a mix of course and try to make it nice but oftentimes i'll hear somebody else playing and i won't even know what it is i'm like oh that sounds good what's that (laughs) oh that's you you dumbass uh 
But with this, it was very much like that. It was like it just kind of came. It came very unforced. I didn't ever feel like I was laboring over it, except for that kind of that one week where I really intently worked out the vocals. Um, but again, even that was a, 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 a fun process because it felt like a challenge in exploring it. So this one for me, and because, yeah, I haven't, especially thank you, COVID virus, I have not... Uh, gotten to gotten to play these songs in public you know or 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 even rehearse them much i was working on that a little bit until it became pointless but uh yeah so these are still very magical like even to learn how to play them live when i was working on that it was a challenge i i've never played piano in public before and sang at the same time so this whole thing is kind of uh pushing me out there and into an uncomfortable uh new place uh, which I've chosen to embrace because that's that's ultimately how we all grow as you confront those uh, uncomfortable situations and move through them. So, so you're now learning Steve Von Till riffs the way that we all have to learn Steve Von Till riffs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a disadvantage because I'm uh, I'm probably more of a hack than anybody listening. So, <laughs> um, spoiler alert! I think the new album um is probably the closest thing you've done um to if i should fall to the field each grain of sand beneath the sea you have no faith back in 2002 and there was like a period from I don't, what was it uh, a grave as a grim horse is that right um from there onwards where i felt like more of a sort of country noir kind of doom folk element came yeah. into the the records you were producing including the the towns of Anzant cover record that you did you can't touch me if you want to i got poison just might bite you Is it a difference in the way you approach the writing? Because as you say, this wasn't written, this was just something that flowed that has led to that different feel. Because it did seem like you were sort of, for the course of a few records, going in one direction and this is kind of pushed back to a much gothier, darker thing. You said gothier. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an expletive in this part of the world, man. <laughs> um, so... I guess I see what you're saying, but I, to me, I feel it's very much the next logical step after the previous record, A Life Unto Itself. Where the autumn winds blow right through me and oh. Because I felt like I, in A Life Unto Itself, I was bringing some of those kind of harvest man elements where i'm a little bit more free in the way i'm approaching it and a little less like uh intentionally uh, americana ish i guess i'd like i mean well i'm from the american west so you can't totally pull that out of me but uh but because there was not a, a single guitar on this you know yeah it, it definitely pushed it into some different zone i've never really written like that well yeah i didn't write it so i've never written this album so I, yeah, I guess emotionally, I I feel it's very tied to the previous one as far as my development as a, as a word smith. Um, it, it's, it's interesting you were describing the sort of uh, a jet lag that that they kind of informed it originally because it does sound dreamier, and it might be for me that as a listener that lack of guitar, but there is a slightly more ethereal quality to it without that more kind of familiar flavor in there. Yeah, some of the some of the pieces were straight up abstract ambient with no rhythm or pulse or anything at all to follow. Um and so after I had come up with the vocal melodies, I had to anchor anchor them afterwards with some like low synth notes to resonate as as the as the melody shifted just to so I wasn't kind of singing out there in 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 the ether, you yeah, know? yeah, but uh some roots. Yeah, but it very much was very hallucinatory. I think it's a very psychedelic record, even though it's not like, you know, fuzz pedal psychedelic. It, it's super, super trippy for me. You kind of stole my question. Not one of the questions I was going to ask there, that last one, Chris, a little bit. Because um, <laughs> I, I was really curious as to how the process of record or writing and recording this record had differed from your previous solo albums, but you've kind of touched on that a little bit already. But I think it's really interesting you had this impetus to not really want to 
have a plan of what you're creating and just kind of let it go and be free. Um, and it's that, that aspect of freedom is kind of what, what I want to touch upon. Do you feel as though that you're maybe less free in other solo records compared to this one? Or like, where, where does this sit for you in terms of how, how, it, how your creative process came into play? It felt very liberating in, in, in a lot of ways to, to uh, in fact, my entire creative career is sort of the art of learning to let go and to get out of my own way. And that whatever cerebrally I come up with is, in, is inherently weaker than whatever flows naturally or comes more from the gut. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, also over the years, you know, as, as life has many more irons in the fire and many more responsibilities, I've had to learn to allow for very short periods of time to be very productive. You know, I, I'm here in this nice home recording studio that I always wished I had, but I'm always 15 feet over that direction paying bills for neurot recordings after I get home from my day job where, <laughs> you know, uh, so I really don't take any of it for granted. And, and I've, I've tried to look at the whole process with, with a deep gratitude and appreciation for the fact that I'm ever allowed a glimpse into the creative process and that kind of, uh, weird unknown place where, uh, poetry, music and art come from. You know, like tapping into that greater, that thing that's greater than ourselves. And, and it feels like over time I get, uh, it's easier to be able to slip into that for these brief and productive periods of time. And sometimes when these, I'm, I don't even ask for them and they come knocking <laughs> and fo- force me into them. I, it's even more, uh, I'm even more grateful for those opportunities. And, and uh, so this 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 one also though gave me a sense of uh since it pulled something out of me very different um i can suffer from a lot of self doubt and a lot of lack of confidence in everything we've done i mean you know even people wouldn't believe it but even at some of our neurosis material we could sit around and listen to that and go that ah, sucks <laughs> <laughs> you know a bunch of crap and and part of that i think is a, is a positive drive and it forces you to up up your game and take it to the next level but but part of me was very apprehensive to kind of throw this out there because it was so different and i'm like you know uh it's so beautiful and so different and even like especially when i sync it up at the same period of time i'm writing a poetry book even saying the words i'm writing a poetry book i choke on them halfway out my (laughs) You know, you, you feel a little exposed, man. <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 imposter syndrome, like hundred percent raging. You know, like who the fuck do you think you are to put out a poetry there's, book? There's something really interesting that you you mentioned, and it's a little bit of a spoiler alert um, because we've obviously covered a lot of metal in the course of the podcast, and Dave's our sort of resident metal guy, and Mark's our kind of hardcore guy. But I think I've always been a a fan of neurosis and I've always been a fan of a certain style of metal and it, you made the point about writing coming more from the heart than from the head you know more emotional less cerebral and um, I hope you take this in the, the, the manner it's intended I always felt that was a strength in neurosis versus I've got time for the likes of my sugar Dave's a big fan of the shug but mm-hmm. it's very cerebral music and I always felt much more viscerally attached to the kind of stuff you guys would produce um, there was a lot maybe a, a, a less refinement but in a positive way in a sort of much more brutal um, unvarnished sort of fashion and I think it's really interesting that you mention that in relation to this music since it's so you know so different and, and on the surface um, you were talking about your poetry book I really I really want to ask you about this so the poetry book the collection you, have you called it Harvest Man or is that just partial title <laughs> uh, it, it, I called it Harvest Man 23 untitled poems and collected lyrics and I titled it Harvest Man because that just sounded like the right title for the book. It, 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 like Harvest Man, ironically, has no lyrics ever like in that musical yeah. project. So it's, it's actually unlinked except for that it's kind of become an AKA, you know, in some ways. Like, uh, yeah. So it just made sense. It made sense with the artwork. It made sense with the, the theme of everything that I've been doing as, as a poet and a solo artist. So, yeah. So I- I read a little bit of the release, and is it tr- is it right that this is a kind of combination of poetry and some lyrics? It's like a little bit of both. It's all my solo lyrics, along with, tw- uh, as the title suggests, 23 untitled poems. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, you know, part of the impetus for the book, interestingly enough, was that week 
I was telling you about the, the buried in snow where I was with the intent of I am going to finish lyrics for this this piece of music during this week. Part of that process, and that's actually always been a part of my process for lyric writing. Lyric lyrics have to serve a song. They have to serve, at least in my writing, they have to serve a sound place, a, a sound environment. The words never come first, um, and so you've got this this oral environment in which. I will hear a cadence or a rhythm or even a vowel sound I have to hang on. I'll be listening to the music, like trying to hear voices in the wind or uh, translate some secret code. And so some of it comes from translating that code of of w what are you hearing in there? What's the garbled message hidden within the music? And then other times I'm just literally ripping off my own journal entries or poetry and stealing lines or phrases or words and just kind of using it however I need to, to get lines that make sonic sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at them and arranging them in some sort of way that also frames some sort of meaning. So in a, in a, in a song lyric, there may be four or five lines taken from poems about completely different aspects of my life or my, my wanderings or psychological wanderings. And, um, they're kind of like collaged, almost like that Burroughs cut up style, but of my own crap and, um, uh, reassembled and they take on a new life and they take on a new meaning. And sometimes I won't know for years what, what that new assembly means to me. Uh, it, it may become later. It may remain a mystery. I'm not sure, but, but poetry on the other hand has to live on a page. It has to own like that real estate of the paper and it has to give everything you want to say emotionally with the words only with no sonic backdrop there's no there's no thing to provide the mood mm -hmm. uh see when you're uh, when you're unconstrained by the like, as you said that the structure the kind of requirements of the song or the things the song suggests and you're purely dealing in the medium of poetry when you go back and look at the two side by side are you seeing a big difference in the way you write without those parameters <laughs> not really uh <laughs> that's consistent it, it, well I, I i do i do have a way i i've i noticed in analyzing it you know again kind of just like when i was uh, so i realized in that week i i stole i stole two two lines and i told myself that i, I was going to write some poems for their own sake and not steal from them that they would just live on their own and i still stole two lines uh, from one of the poems in one of the new <laughs> songs, um, we have uh, we have the sea and we'll always have the sky. They had to live in that song and they had to stay in that poem because the poem was perfect the way it was, and I I didn't want to destroy it for the sake of the end of a song. So, in kind of looking at that and analyzing it and and editing the poetry for publication because I. I Again, it's a first, and it's way out there on a limb, and it it's feel it felt very uh, much of a challenge and walking way out of my comfort zone. Um, I did kind of analyze the way it way it reads, and I I do read a lot of poetry and look at a lot of poetry, and so I kind of uh, looked at what mo other modern poets do and why they break lines the way they break lines, and you know I didn't go to school for any of that stuff. I'm it's self taught expression and. And what I did is I know I noticed I have uh, I have a rhythm, mm -hmm. and I have a way of phrasing things that is as if I would say it out loud. I could break them up to make it look more modern or strange or whatever, but there is a, a sort of I think a classical lyricism, even though it may be abstract and psychedelic terminology, or I, I may tend to want to hide my true personal experiences in plenty of metaphor. It, it, I, I feel like I do have a voice. I do have a rhythm. There is a, a certain cadence to the way I speak and the way I, I write poems, which I didn't ever think about until I had to lay them out in a book. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to ask you about musical influences, but poetry-wise, is there anybody that you, you really admire? I mean, again, don't take it the wrong way, but you seem like a William Blake guy. <laughs> well, who isn't? Just thematically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of course, I like William Blake. Um, there's a, a whole group of the uh, American transcendentalists, uh, Walt Whitman, Ralph okay. Waldo Emerson, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were kind of this group of guys at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution who were pointing out the uh, 
issues that humanity may may face from living in the cities and from uh, becoming part of the um, industrial culture and losing our contact with nature and losing our connection with nature. And they wrote very beautifully about that. Um, I've, I've always been influenced by them. Um, Seamus Heaney, an Irish poet, uh, has been a big influence. Sylvia Plath, Ted Hughes, uh, modern poets. Um, John Trudell was a Native American activist, leader of the American Indian movement. Illusions are handled by seeing through. Clearly there is life ahead. When I step into the brown of her eyes, brown earth color woman takes me into the secrets of her size, gentling me in a balance of passion. Um, was also a poet and a rocker and a rebel. Um, he wrote a lot of poetry, which was very uh, influential to me since I was a teenager and first heard his recordings of of him uh, reading this kind of heavy spiritual poetry uh, on, on top of stuff. Yeah. It's interesting as well, man, because I, you perhaps don't see this and maybe I'm just seeing what I want to see, you know, coming from Scotland. But it does seem like there is a sort of Celtic influence that goes through like a, a whole host of your work whether it's you're talking about people like Seamus Heaney have an influence to some extent and I mean I hear little bits of Celtic stuff in like some of the early Harvest Man recordings just the way you inflect your guitar I mean, even things like your love of monoliths. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go somewhere like Orkney in the north of Scotland. That's where the top of my bucket list is Orkney. Oh, man. We, we recorded up there, um, and there's a house older than the pyramids that you can just walk through. There's no security, nothing. You just walk through this house that's older than the pyramids, man. So there's a lot of that here as well, and I think it's something that feels quite familiar, that kind of cold ghostliness that you manage to encapsulate sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah, again, that, it's been an obsession. And, man, I need to get to Orkney bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've always kind of been obsessed. And the more they the more they find, they keep finding more and more and more in this one very small spot. And, and I think I read even one article where that there some people are hypothesizing that that may have been the epicenter of the megalithic culture and that it, it radiated outward from there. Um, yeah, uh, man, it's amazing. There's there's a studio, by the way, on one of the remote Orkney Islands that you should think about recording at. <laughs> Done. I'm already in. I mean, yeah, I, I I need an excuse, right? So there it is. Um, so obviously we've we've talked about the new record. I just want to kind of have a wee look back at some of the other stuff. We'll go back to neurosis because it's such a huge body of work that you've got with that. But uh, in the other projects that Mark mentioned, obviously we've got Harvest Man, as we said, we've got your own stuff. We've got the Tribes of Neurot stuff that accompanied Neurosis and also operated independently at times. And we've got the Culper Ring record, and I just kind of wanted to ask you generally, first and foremost, seeing the evolution of that sort of atypical, it's, it's not typical rock music, it's not typical ambient music, it's not typical drone music. I know you're a bit of a gearhead when it comes to your guitar and your rig and your, your kind of, I've seen some of your, your gear videos, man, you, you know your shit with that. How much do you think your sound was influenced by changing technology? Because we've, we've spoken in the past about bands like, say, Depeche Mode, where the music they were writing was, obvi was often inspired by a new piece of kit or a new possibility that had opened up. Where, where do you see the balance between the stuff that's landed in your lap and the stuff that's been in your head already? Well, I, I think the tools allow you to find those things, you know, I, I mean, again, being just a self-taught punk rock musician, I mean, I, I really don't have any chops, you know, I, I couldn't play that kind of technical heavy metal stuff that people are talking, I, I don't have those abilities, um, but I can pound out one note like I really mean it <laughs> uh, all day long, and... Um, what always influenced me more than people's technical stuff, you know, like you could say, okay, Jimi Hendrix was a huge influence. And, and yeah, I I wish I had blues chops like that. I wish I had a relationship with my guitar that was intuitive. But man, it was the fucking feedback. And it was the way that primitive gear could turn into some other beast. It, it was, I got asked the other day, you know, 
do you remember when you first really paid attention to like how music should sound? And I, I remember hearing a phaser on a voice on a fade out of a seventies rock record, you know, like you, you, it's on a fade out and then you hear some weird fade, like tape, tape flange or something go across the whole mix as it's fading out. And that, that's the kind of shit or the, um, the way the amp noise comes on right at the beginning of a song, right before they start. And you, you feel the air, that tension before the band comes in, because you've heard that sound that opens up the room they're playing in. Mm. and moves the air those are what i've always been addicted to more than parts or or riffs or uh, well i take that back i mean black sabbath riffs and joy division bass lines all day but um <laughs> but uh but yeah, i mean i've got a feeling we'll come back to that a little bit when we talk about your work yeah. with steve albini uh, because i think that really it was the first time you were able to capture what that excitement that you're talking about talk those, about those opening up a room yeah which which of the stuff that you've done out with neurosis? I mean, it, say of the tribes of neurot stuff. I mean, the, the 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 whole notion of using insects for for the album was just mental, but yet it turned out so well, man. I mean. Which of that stuff really excites you still to go back and, and listen to it? Is there, are there any of them that you really still get like a real buzz off? Say that they're, they're unsung in your book in the sense that you're like, shit, man, we really nailed it on that. I don't really go and listen to any of it, but there's a couple things we did. One of which is well, well known and one of which is not is uh, the Tribes of Neurot Grace companion disc to Times of Grace. Yeah. I thought was um i thought that we had really nailed it with that because uh very few people can actually <laughs> set up two stereos and count it off and do it properly you know as evidenced by, by your, your clap at the beginning <laughs> of this episode but uh but youtube co collapses it to stereo you know that's true and so it, true. It, it really it 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 has to be out of four different speakers for it to make sense and so that the way that we use real primitive technology of, of we would just what are we hearing goes along to this you know sometimes we distilled some of the harmony but we had to make it abstract and not rhythm based because they were never going to be in sync so if you made something ry rhythmic rhythmic dependent it would never work yeah so we had to look at the the kind of key or the sound or the soundscape of the neurosis song and have something that would be it would make sense emotionally and sonically within a couple seconds uh, without detracting. And so lots of disembodied voices, lots of interesting uh, reflections or processing. And I, I thought that was a really successful experiment. And um, you may be pleased to know that actually featured in the podcast a few months ago, just as the just as the plague kicked in, we put a mixtape together of uh, themes of the apocalypse, and uh, yeah. Grace was on there. <laughs> Can I, I also the thing I love about that record and that idea is the fact that it asks so much of the listener, and that the listener has to actually go through a sort of ritual of you know finding those two stereos and putting on the two records at the same time, and do you find that? I guess with everything now streaming on on YouTube, how do you how do you test the listener like that f from now on? Because everything's so you can just click everything now. Yeah, well, it goes back to if you want to hear it right, you need four speakers. So last yeah. time I checked, YouTube wasn't quadraphonic. So uh, <laughs> that's up to each person to to find themselves. I mean, to me, I, mean, I, I don't know why people wouldn't want to stop being lazy and find things like that. I mean, that part of the impetus of that. Um, I mean, there were some predecessors for that. Flaming Lips did that four record uh, Zyrica project mm -hmm. where it was all four of them had to sync. Uh, yeah, it's not so successful. Though. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, so I mean, you, guys, you guys doubled it with Kieran, didn't you? You went for four in that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Forgot about that one. That's a good one, too. Uh, that's what happens when you go to Ireland for three weeks and crawl around in cairns with microphones. Um, <laughs> but, 
hence why I need to get to Orkney. Um, so, um, part of that impetus of how do you get la- listeners to not be lazy? I mean, I think back to one one of the inspirations to Grace was uh, I was sitting in in my flat in San Francisco and I had a a cheap cassette I got at the local pharmacy of uh, Crackling Fire. And I put that in my clock radio that had a cassette player and and played that. But I was already listening to Brian Eno uh, on land, on the regular stereo. And I'm like, that's a neat combo. And and it was a freaking Christmas Eve, actually. And I was alone there. And uh, then I turned on the TV, which was just coming through the TV speaker. And it was the the freaking Pope giving a midnight mass in Latin. (laughs) and so already I was like, holy shit, this is great. I've got Crackling Fire, the Pope in Latin, and Brian Eno. And, uh, <laughs> and so then I went over to my recording stuff and kind of threw some whatever speakers I had available there. I, I put on some other kind of glitchy thing that was trapped in, the, in the, the digital delay device there. And that was like, okay, like you can take all these sources and, and mix them into something completely unplanned and unintentional and, and interesting. So why other people don't spend more time doing that is, is beyond me. Um, it, it's tons of fun, if nothing else. You know, we had some uh, quadraphonic gigs in Glasgow with a PA at the front and a PA at the back. Man, maybe uh, you could set it up so dream. you could play "Times of Grace" at the front and "Grace" from the back of the room. <laughs> our, our sound guy, Dave Clark, has been wanting his own speakers at the sound desk to to blast the opposite direction for years. It's just not within our means. But uh, but yeah, the other thing, and actually, I haven't listened to it in a while, but I, I was wondering about it, and it and it brought to mind something that's maybe unsung it. It, it's fact it, it might be so unknown i don't actually know where it lives it was uh i i believe it was a sun that never sets we did a, a kind of tribute to alvin lucier the sound artist who did that i am sitting in a room project we did an entire i am sitting in a room mix of i believe it's a sun that never sets unless i'm wrong is that a resonant sun that it came out as? Is that the one that you uh, played it like 30 times through a microphone and a, a tape? A resonant sun, yeah. And see, but where is that? Is that like on the DVD? Where does that live? That's a good know. question, man. I, I, don't, question. I don't know either. <laughs> but I was wondering about it the other day because I heard someone reference Alvin Lucier. I'm like, wow, I, I've never actually heard anybody talk about that. I wonder if we, we snuck that in there under the radar too far. No, there's people <laughs> out there talking about it, man, because I was, I was reading them talking about it this week. I'll have to figure out where the hell we put that. (laughs) (laughs) Might be the DVD. And that concludes part one of our chat with Steve Wontel. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Tune in later on this week for part two.